Before the 18th and 19th centuries, the humanities and the sciences were not distinct. The intellectual and professional terrains were not neatly divided between the sciences and humanities. The divide today, however, seems clear, particularly in our universities. The image we see before us is an illustration drawn by Harry Campbell for the October 2013 Chronicle of Higher Education issue. It depicts a Parthenon destroyed by the split between the STEM and humanities disciplines. The Parthenon represents the democracy of education and culture, but a halved Parthenon like this suggests not only that culture is fragmented, but that its parts are unequal. This imbalance affects both sides and is evident in the disconnect the sciences and humanities have with each other and the public. Moreover, this divide has made itself increasingly apparent in the last 200 years, but the relationship between the sciences and humanities goes further than that and is not always clear-cut. This presentation will review a brief history of the sciences and humanities while emphasizing the causes of their estrangement. Let's begin with the state of information then and now. Around 1440, Johannes Gutenberg developed a revolutionary printing press. From a specially crafted alloy frame to never-before-used oil-based ink, Gutenberg's books were higher quality and more durable than those of previous presses. His press galvanized the dawn of an industrial age for information and set new records for ease, availability, accuracy, and cost of printing. Before the Gutenberg printing press, books were either copied by hand or printed from engraved wooden blocks, processes that could take months or years to complete. With the Gutenberg press, literacy and knowledge rapidly spread. It was used originally to print the Bible, and it did this at a phenomenal pace producing hundreds of copies over the course of a few years, dozens of pages in a day, and consequently democratizing information and knowledge that used to be kept solely and possessively by the church and elite. With the spread of information has come its rapid growth and consequently the phenomenon of information overload. It has been claimed that just over 400 years ago, a person could consume every book in print, in fact, it has been suggested that John Milton, author of Paradise Lost, did just this. Since then, we have accumulated a monumental mass of published knowledge amounting to at least 129 million books, according to Google software engineer Leonard Taker, and 300,000 serial publications, according to the library standard Ulrich's Periodicals Directory. Now, the possibility of reading every book in print is far beyond any individual's grasp. Such information explosion necessitated subject specialization. In the 19th century, scholars and laymen tackled the problem by passing the time collecting and categorizing things, including plants, bugs, bird eggs, whatever they could get their hands on. And this obsession with organization went on to influence the way we classified not just objects, but ideas. As libraries accumulated more information more cheaply, they opened their doors to the public. And this change demanded the installation as well of a common library classification system. In 1876, the Dewey Decimal System, the system used in libraries today, met this demand. Unfortunately, one side effect of all this subject specialization is that the STEM and humanities disciplines have become more isolated from each other. And this isolation has led to a history of hesitance, hostility, and indifference between the disciplines when instead there should be collaboration, appreciation, and wonder. The condition of the contemporary world as imminently fragmented is what C.P. Snow notoriously observed in his 1959 Reed lecture entitled The Two Cultures of the Scientific Revolution. Snow coined the phrase two cultures to describe a deplorable state of willful isolation between the disciplines of the sciences and the humanities. He called this tension, quote, a gulf of mutual incomprehension, sometimes particularly among the young, 
hostility and dislike, but most of all, lack of understanding, end quote. He intended for his lecture to spark intelligent dialogue between the two, to focus on the state of education which at the time came from a tradition of favoring the humanities. But his wording was perhaps a little too inciting. For instance, he argued that the weight of culpability, the reason for interdisciplinary conflict, lay with the, quote, vain humanists, who he typified as clueless of even the simplest scientific principles. Meanwhile, he complimented the scientists by labeling them, quote, by and large, the soundest group of intellectuals we have, end quote. Ever since he delivered his lecture, scholars of both sides have sought to defend, redefine, and counterbalance the brewing waves of antagonism that have developed between the two sets of disciplines. In 1962, Thomas Kuhn tried his hand at negotiating between the two, and in his seminal book titled The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, he argued that the sciences are subjective, that is, that objective claims thus far have only been established via a collective of individual experiences. Later, in 1987, George Louis Levine published his groundbreaking book One Culture, which explored the possibilities that the sciences and humanities employ discourses that originate from the same cultural sources. In this sense, one may consider the sciences and humanities as ultimately inextricable because they are both cultural technologies, means of interrogating, preserving, and advancing cultural integrity. However, the efforts of Kuhn, Levine, and others seemed only to exacerbate the already fragile relations between the disciplines. The 1990s saw two distinct lines of bitter exchange develop. First, there was the fear that the sciences were becoming flesh-eating. This was in response to the advancements of cybernetics, that is, the mathematical and philosophical study of communication in animals and machines. Cybernetics challenges boundaries. It gives legitimate consideration to questions such as, is a blind man's cane a part of him? And is it possible to download the human consciousness to non-human receptacles? Also in the 1990s were what has been dubbed the science wars, a prolonged conflict between the scientific realists and postmodern critics, the latter of whom trended upon the metaphoric use of scientific theories. These tensions culminated in the acerbic Sokol hoax, an infamous affair propelled by Alan Sokol's article titled Transgressing the Boundaries Towards the Transformative Hermeneutics of Quantum Gravity. After the article was published, Sokol smugly revealed that what he had written was merely, quote, a pastiche of left-wing cant, fawning references, grandiose quotations, and outright nonsense structured around the silliest quotations by postmodernists that he could find about mathematics and physics, end quote. In short, it was a satirical representation of postmodern criticism submitted to a postmodern journal and accepted. Even though this was before the journal began practicing peer review, the event, as one critic famously said, quote, cleansed the atmosphere with a dose of well-administered ridicule, end quote. Afterwards, many interdisciplinary scholars have felt the weight of what has come to be known as tormented interdisciplinarity, some cautioning that we should be wary, uneasy even, of the nightmare, the presence of science. We now find ourselves in the wake of such vitriol as we continue to explore the grounds of representation and reality in both the sciences and the humanities. But the relationship between the sciences and humanities has never been clear-cut. They are social constructs shaped to handle observations and articulations of the cosmos. To the Greeks, art and science in the modern sense simply did not exist except in a network of concepts pinned down by such words as sophia, philosophia, logos, techne, and episteme. When the two have been trimmed down to simpler terms, they can be discussed as branches of a single predecessor, techne, which at the time included both the meditative and mechanical arts, a 
of the sciences and humanities, including, for instance, medicine and music. This suggests that the two disciplines were once acutely connected, both serving speculative and technical uses, reciprocally influencing each other throughout much of early history. For scholars like René Descartes, Galileo Galilei, and Sir Isaac Newton, physics especially, as the most theoretical of the sciences, clearly shared a foundation with the contemplative humanities, both tracing their ancestry to the meditative arts. One example of the ways the sciences and humanities remain bound even today is in their concurrent uses of metaphor. As Gillian Beer, a rare champion for using literary devices and scientific explorations, argues, quote, the activity of making analogies is essential to human perception as much as to argument, meaning presupposes analogies. We understand the mu by reference to the already known, end quote. Thus, it makes sense then when we hear that, in part, Sir Isaac Newton became notable because of his claims that analogical reasoning could lead to better understandings of unknown worlds, from the atomistic to the celestial, physical to moral. As Newtonian physics has been revised over the centuries, this strand of philosophy has remained. As Newton compared falling bodies, like cannonballs and apples, to planetary orbits, leading him to the discovery of universal gravitation, Charles Darwin conceptualized evolution through the metaphor of a tree of life, and several theorists have analogized particles, envisioning them on a millimeter scale or larger as a toiling demon, mysterious cat, or musical strings, all to ease conception of the physical laws they follow. Thus it has been argued that the origins of science are fictive, a hypothesis being like a predictive metaphor or analogy applying some set of known rules to a new event or anomaly in order to establish a tentative conclusion. Between ancient Greece and the 1990 science wars, great change happened. Developments of the 19th century changed the dynamics between the sciences and humanities. Science came into its modern self. The title scientist was formalized for the first time, and scientific fields such as chemistry, physics, and geology were professionalized and institutionalized. The increase in scientific activity was stimulated in large part by and for industrialist, reformative, and governmental incentives that focused on education and the greater incorporation of technologies. As such, revolutions in printing made materials for education and popularization of the sciences cheaper and more widespread. Organized entities, such as the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge, SDUK, and Science and Art Department, DSA, stimulated the scientific education of the working and middle classes by disseminating inexpensive texts, raising science college establishments, aiding in the standardized training of science teachers, and supporting the installation of scientific collections in schools. Ultimately, the masses were inundated with reports revolving radical new theories of galvanism, biological evolution, geological history, and sanitation and bacteriology. Meanwhile, technological innovations shrank the nation, creating means of communication and connectivity with steamboats, automated printing presses, cameras, telegraphs, railroads, automobiles, and telephones. In short, it is during this century that the history of differentiation really takes hold. Inventions of a scientific nature made life easier, healthier, and more enjoyable. Access to refrigeration and railroad transportation meant fresh foods for urban areas. Investigations into bacteriology and automated looms led to safer foods and better quality clothing. Meanwhile, the first cameras, motion pictures, and phonographs enlivened entertainment of the 19th century. Yet, many remained wary of these innovations. Refrigeration was avoided by those who believed only God should have the power to create cold. These same individuals would warn that consumption of previously frozen foods would incur God's wrath. Likewise, telephones, electric lights, subways, and automobiles were greeted with suspicion such that even doctors would caution patients against the hazards of driving, while directions for turning on electric lights included such disclaimers as, quote, the use of electricity for lighting is in no way harmful to health, nor does it affect the soundness of sleep." End quote. The transcendence of science beyond tradition and common sense frustrated many a layman of the century, 
But even then, there was a desire for collaboration. In the 19th century, Thomas H. Huxley and Matthew Arnold are notorious for their dialogue covering the merits and demerits of the humanities and sciences. The humanities holding the status of tradition and authority, the sciences being bold and strange. Huxley is usually depicted as defending the sciences, while Arnold champions the humanities. However, their conversations were not and should not be remembered so plainly as just a scientist against a humanist. Instead, it should be remarked that the two also encouraged cooperation with each other's disciplines. While Huxley remarks that, quote, the great truth is that art and literature and science are one, end quote, all three being necessary for a sufficient education of the active mind, Arnold replied that, quote, a genuine humanism is scientific, end quote, well read in the modern sciences and methodically rational. More to the point, their campaigns are essentially focused on whether the sciences and or the humanities would be the best tools for supporting and advancing the sustenance of culture. Yet here we are still, still struggling to harmonize the rapidly expanding disciplines and clouds of information emanating from the sciences and humanities, we speculate. And we ask, for instance, what is our place in this brave new world? Are we just another rung on the evolutionary ladder? Are our physical and psychological processes so mechanical that eventually machines may reach the same level of complexity as the human mind and body? Are our minds detachable from our bodies? What makes us human. And of course we ask, who are the creations of science? Discovery has always been controversial. So more to the point, what we have seen in this brief history is an evolution of the dynamics between the sciences and humanities. This story begins with the two disciplines as indistinguishable collaborating parts of ancient cultures, and then proceeds to review the struggles of science against the prejudices and historical authority of the humanities. But now we find that the humanities struggle against the prejudices and modern authority of the sciences. This leaves us with a question that presents itself to humanists accused of being useless and scientists accused of being disconnected. And that question is, what do the humanities and sciences offer each other? And how can we make such cooperation happen?